system to somebody. It ended up being the state of, uh, of Wisconsin. Uh, and at that point, Representative Prosser was, a, was, was a, a big instrument in getting some state support for this. Uh, Tommy Thompson came on the case after a while. So we ended up with some political support to get the state involved and the negotiation process uh, continued. Uh, and to answer the money issue back here, initially the core just wanted to give the system to the state. You saw the disrepair in what we had. There were millions of dollars if we were going to go in and either abandon it, fill those in, or to, uh, uh, to rebuild it. Uh, and in no way was, was anyone going to take it under those circumstances. And then the, the, the price came up. It, came up, uh, it was $2.1 million, and that went back and forth over a period of years. And it kept growing, and it finally grew uh, to $11.8 million. And this was uh, back about in 19, oh, uh, about 2000, in the year 2000. And that was what the core determined it would take them, uh, or cost them, to abandon all the lock systems. And then surplus the properties to GSA, to whoever might want to buy the properties that are allowed. Uh, that was the starting point for the negotiations. At that point, with $11.8 million as a base fund, uh, the state said, uh, we will cost share on that, and the Corps said, we'll cost share on that, uh, and they looked at another uh, $11.2 million that would come into the, into the process. So the Corps kicked in 5.6, the state kicked in 5.6, uh, and the state said the local area, either government or people, have to come up with half of that, $2.8 million. And so what happened was, local government at that time said, we're not going to do it. So the Friends of the Fox and Cushing and some other instrumental uh, uh, or, uh, people in the area said, we'll raise the money. Uh, and that money then, the fundraising program uh, began, and essentially that money, $2.8 million, has been raised. Uh, we looked at a seven-year process for that. Uh, so that's where the money came from. So a trust fund was set up that was administered by the three community foundations, Fox Valley, uh, Green Bay, and Oshkosh. Uh, they were the fiscal agents, uh, and they were also involved in fundraising. Uh, and we set up a financial plan for 30 years uh, to restore the locks, to maintain the locks, and still have money that if we have to dispose of the system at the end of that period or continue it, we would have base monies to be able to do that. Uh, and so that's the, that's the fiscal end of the this particular process it was a very difficult process because it had federal, state, local people involved in it. It had memorandums of understanding. It had the whole financial plan. Uh, it took state legislation, uh, and it was a major effort. Uh, but that was done, and that's why the locks uh, are being restored at this point in time. Uh, again, the locks were a key feature to get that question answered before the, the Harry's Parkway really became a reality because this was a kingpin on, on the northern end for that parkway. To have the lock system, the historic lock system, as a real basis for that, that national uh, recognition. Uh, and uh, so that's why you'll see a lot more about the Harry's Parkway uh, uh, in the upcoming uh, uh, months and years. And we're at uh, questions and comments. What happens in Portage? Is this deserted or what? Where? Well, Portage. Or or and, 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 you want to go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. No, the Portage is uh, Portage is part of the Heritage Parkway right now, and there's been an active group, the Portage Canal Society, uh, has been around for many years, <laughs> trying to restore, preserve that that Portage Canal area, and there's a lock down there as well. There used to be locks along the Upper Fox River. Most of those were abandoned in 1960 to 62. Uh, but they are very active. They got a grant down there. They've been doing historic uh, work uh, on the canal uh, and on that area as well, and, and they're an active player in the Heritage Parkway. What is a guard lock? A guard lock is, a, remember when we saw the picture of the lock, uh, and it's a container, it's got two doors, okay, that blocks and it allows the water level. What a guard lock is, is in essence, it's like a, almost like a dam. It's got one set of doors. 
Uh, and you can then block that off and stop the water from going below the guard lock. Okay? And the, and, and the reason for the, for the guard locks were primarily maintenance issues. Uh, and the guard locks were in the front of multiple locks in the canal, okay, where there were uh, a, a series of dams in there. And so the guard locks were used, for example, in Little Shoot uh, to drain the canal if you had to go into maintenance. And in the case of Little Shoot, there's some other reasons. Uh, there was one in Katana uh, as well that's abandoned now. Um, but that's, that's why they had the guard locks. Would you explain what? how the locks are open? Pardon? Would you explain, are the locks going to be manually opened like they were before? Yes. Uh, it's, it's just as they did back in the 1850s or 1870s. There's a manually open system. Many of the locks around the country, if you go, are, are automated now, where they've got the hydraulics or gears that open them up. But there are a few hand-operated ones yet. There's, there's one in Ohio. Um, there's a, a, at the George, Georgetown, if you see some of the locks when you're in Washington, that's a different type, but it's manually operated too. It's a big handle almost. Uh, but these will continue to be uh, manually operated. That's a really distinctive feature of our system yes. that it retains the um, turn of the century technology. Is that one in Menasha? Is that by the Trestle Trail? Yes. Okay. That, that had been a steel gate split in there. Isn't it? Yes, we have, we have uh, some of those locks were modernized in the 1930s, uh, and the, the wooden gates that you see were replaced with steel gates. The mechanisms are still the same, but, but the gates themselves, and then on those locks when they were rebuilt as well, they, uh, they, they in essence put uh, concrete uh, containers in instead of the cut block ones that you see on, uh, on most of the older locks. So they were, uh, I guess what I call modernized lock, and, and, and those those locks, like the Pier, the Nasha, uh, and Little Rapids, uh, were not eligible for the registry yet. The site was, and the houses were, but the lock itself, because it was a modernized lock, was not yet eligible. Now, it probably will be at some point. Uh, There's a 50-year rule, typically, for listing structures or buildings on the National Register. Okay. My question is, I live by the Nasha lock. Obviously, there was a choice made here between doing an historical rebuild versus coming in and rather than tuck pointing the land and stone, versus coming in and pouring a concrete retaining wall for the purpose of getting the lock open. Right. So, was it easier to get funding to do the historic? <laughs> Or would it have been easier to simply say we're going to rebuild these locks brand new, rip out the land stone, pour in concrete, and get this thing running again? Part, part of it was a, was a study to, to go in and, and, and uh, look at that. Uh, the Menasha lock was, that was in the 1970s when that one was done. And that was what we call one of the really old uh, stone locks up to that point in time. Uh, and the Corps chose, that's when the Corps of Engineers still had it, they chose to put in the concrete. Okay, because they, they were looking at saying steel gates and concrete is easier. You don't have to do the maintenance. You don't have to go on a 20-year cycle with tuck pointing and timber gates. Okay, uh, so they put that in. Much more expensive, though. We just did a, a, a study uh, in Kakana, and we have uh, one lock there, Kakana number five, which is the old type lock uh, called stone and timber cribbing that went in uh, in the 1850s. Uh, and most of the locks, you saw some of the pictures were that way. Uh, we looked at that lock, uh, and we got a, 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 an extra grant uh, uh, to, to do that lock now. But we're rebuilding it <coughs> in, its, in its current state, in the old state, the timber cribbing. Uh, the stone that's there is still good. It's costing us about a million dollars to rebuild that, replace the gates, replace timbers, and so forth on it. If we replace that lock with um, steel gates, uh, and reinforced concrete, it would cost us about $3 million. Okay. So it would be about three times as much to modernize it. Uh, and besides that, it's, it, it's really a rep the most representative lock of the old lock system. So historically, we lose that as well. Where did most of the stone block come from? Uh, from the area. Uh, oh, some of them came, came, I think, from High Cliff. There's mm -hmm. a, there was a quarry over there, and they brought it by barge. Some of it, we, uh, we believe, was taken right from the lock site because some of these locks were cut into bedrock. Most of the locks have a bedrock base. And when they built the stones on it, it's, 
actually on bedrock, so it's a really good foundation. And they cut down in, and this was back in, in the 1850s and 1870s, they actually cut out that stone and used some of that stone in the construction of the lot. In your historical research, have you also uncovered some of the other lock sites? I know Nina had one long before the Nash lock was. And I think there were some other lock sites in earlier versions way back when that are now long disused. Well, and I, that's come up in Nina, uh, and, and I have yet to see any documentation on that. I, I haven't seen anything. I don't know if Dan has. Well, I, and I think, too, that with this project, our research is very site-specific. You know, we're getting in and trying to figure out when and where the nuts and bolts were put in, and it's less kind of large overview. I think some of the work with the um, Heritage Parkway on the interpretive master plan may take up some of those themes. I wanted to add to the other fellow's question about um, the replication of the lock sites with historical accuracy. Um, this was something I found out that I was really intrigued by. Despite the fact that the Corps of Engineers created these environmental assessments that recommended, their number one recommendation was basically filling the sites and, and selling off the property. They also initiated getting the sites listed on the National Register. So that was kind of, well, we're doing this, but if they do end up in somebody's hand, we really want their historic authenticity maintained. So as soon, you know, once a federal property is on the National Register, all sorts of regulations kick in that, um, pretty much, you know, cause the owner to work with SHPO to come up with historically sensitive solutions. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> I was kind of mad at it when I was thinking, what do we think? And they want Then I realized, well, they, have, they authorize a the National Register nomination mm -hmm. with their other angles. Yes? I have all the artwork that was listed on the uh, that was that was part of the dam there. That, that that's a private dam. Yeah. There was the lock or the dam tender. Oh, that, all right. that uh, metal stuff that he yeah. made. Yeah. Well, he he was replaced. Uh, and I, I think what happened. I think there was a uh, maybe somebody knows here. The ownership of that changed or something. I believe the uh, dam yeah, dam tender he, left. He, he retired. retired. He retired. He retired. There's somebody else in there, and the guy took his lock. His art was. <laughs> that was that was a little bit controversial because I know there were yeah. the letters to the paper. Yeah. Some people loved it and some people hated it. It's crazy. Can these be, the locks become more inadequate? Will there be um, will it be for any kind of meat vessel or from canoes to rowboats to I mean to uh more Sure, any vessel. Okay, the question was um, when the lots are open, are they open to any type of vessel? It could be small or big or whatever. And, and uh, the, the limit of the lot itself on size, uh, the lots are, are, are almost 150 feet, so you can get a pretty big hole in there. Uh, and they're about uh, 32 feet or so, 30 to 32 feet wide. Uh, and they were made really for barge traffic. So you can have some big vessels through there. And probably one of the keys would be more of the uh, navigational uh, depth that you would have uh, if you had uh, a large draw on a boat. There's areas in the system that you might have a problem with. You know? uh, so I don't think the, the maximum size is, is, a, is a real big issue here. As far as small ones, uh, I don't know if you saw pictures of the kayak, the annual kayak events, paddle paddle, or partner paddle. Park. Park, park, Some park, park, like whatever park, that is. Park, park, park. Okay. Anyway, uh, there were like um, I think 200 maximum was 280 or something like that canoes and kayaks in, in the lot at one time. Okay. So you can walk through with that, but there is a, a, a group of uh, friends of the Fox is involved, and there's some other uh, groups, Greenways, that have, have got uh, kayak portages that are going to go around the locks. They're in Appleton now. They're constructing some in uh, Menasha, uh, Little Shoot. They're going to be all the way down the system. So even if the locks are closed or somebody go through the lockage, you'll be able to go around it uh, on a, uh, uh, on a uh, uh, takeout. You have to carry it. Like, you know, they, the, 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 the explorers years ago and the Indians had to portage them in the falls. Now you have to portage the locks. <laughs> 